Matthew chapter 26 and uh, John chapter 18. And uh, this is a story that we all know of Peter denying the, uh, the Lord three times. And for time's sake, I'll just get right into it. Uh, verse 69, it says, Now Peter sat without in the palace, meaning outside the palace, and the damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And if we look through the next verses, uh, we know that Peter denies the Lord more times. But notice verse 74 in Matthew 26. It says, Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And the point here I want to make is, Peter wasn't bold for the Lord Jesus Christ when he was all alone. He ended up cowering and denying his Lord. So my title today is going to be Finding Boldness in the Last Days. And my first point is, is home alone with boldness. And as we notice in verse 69 that Peter uh, cowered uh, when he denied the Lord and his faith wasn't all that when he, when he was alone. And for us Christians today, I really want to hit here uh, because it's important. And I want to ask you, how many of you have been bold for the Lord Jesus Christ when you have been all alone? How many of you have been bold for the Lord Jesus Christ when there are no brothers around you, when no sisters are around you? Have you been bold for the Lord Jesus Christ? We're living in this apostate age where many of us Christians have lost, we have lost our boldness for the Lord. And I'm not even talking about standing up for the government. I'm not talking about, you know, acting like a fool and being zealous and trying to get attention for yourself. I'm just talking about the every single things in your life. Whether you're going to the grocery store, are you shining your light everywhere? where you go? Are you shining your light where you're going to uh, the doctor's appointment or going for a hike? Are you shining your light or are you embarrassed about what you believe in? Are you shining your light? You know, for example, maybe a friend comes up to you and he tells you that uh, uh, you, lo you lost touch with them and he asks you how you've been doing and he doesn't know that you're saved, but you just move on with a different subject. You don't talk about what happened, what the Lord did for your life, that he saved a soul, a wretch like you, right? And that he saved your soul from hell and that he gave you eternal home up in heaven and a mansion up in heaven one day. You don't. But you know what? We don't reflect on the things that happens in our life. When we go out and be bold for the Lord, we don't remember the good things that He's done for us. Amen? Just like Brother Ralph, for example. Brother Ralph, uh, he went, uh, co uh, his co-workers, he's uh, witnessing to his co-workers, his clients as well. How many souls wouldn't have gotten saved if Brother Ralph didn't witness to his co-workers? Amen? How many souls wouldn't have got saved if Brother Jonathan didn't just go in the middle street and just went up to any person that he could go? How many souls when they got saved. I wouldn't have even thought of this sermon if I wasn't a little bold for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it's kind of a funny story, but you guys may not really think it's funny. But uh, the story basically was uh, I, I wanted to see uh, my mom's uh, neighbor. Basically, I just wanted to say hi. just wanted to say hi. But uh, basically, uh, I went up there and I was wearing Randy Gorski's uh, Jesus sweater, amen. And uh, she noticed it and she kept saying that I really like your sweater and uh, it's really a blessing. And I was like, oh, wow, praise God. And she told me that she's saved and uh, she's a Christian. And she told me that her kids even pray more than her. I was like, oh, wow, praise the Lord. But the funny part is, is that uh, she told me before they went to bed one day, uh, basically, that they were praying. And then uh, she said that the kids were like, oh, Lord, I I'm really tired right now. I don't really feel like praying. So uh, really, just good night, I, I guess. But yeah, but the point here is that that, that funny interaction, that, that interaction, uh, being bold for the Lord, just the simple things of wearing a Jesus sweater. What did they do? It got me to hopefully uh, be a blessing to you guys in discernment, amen? And also I got to know another sister in the Lord that maybe could be a Bible believer one day, amen? amen. But we don't reflect on these things. We don't reflect on the simple things. When we be bold for the Lord, we don't know, uh, how, we, don't, we forget of, uh, how He can move on us and how He can move when we start being bold for the Lord. My second point is struggles with boldness. John 18, I hope you guys are there. Got to move quickly. Verse 5. It reads, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he, and Judas also, which betrayed him, and stood with them. And uh, go to verse 10. It reads, uh, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. And Peter, we notice here that Peter was bold for the Lord when there were brethren around with them. And even when the Lord Jesus Christ was with them, he was bold for the Lord. Peter's problem wasn't being bold for the, uh, boldness for the Lord with brethren around him, but his problem was when he was all alone, he cowered and he lost his faith. 
and Jesus Christ, amen? I mean, not amen, but uh, anyways, uh, if that's any of us today, you know, we need to really reflect on that and ask ourselves, you know? Uh, a lot of us Christians are only bold when we have that backup. We are. We're only bold from that back. It's just like, it's just like those young punk teens, uh, those young punk teens that think they're all that when they have the big crowd. But you know what? They, when, you, when they're in the middle of Timbuktu and uh, they're all by themselves, they cower and they frail like little men. Yeah. And uh, uh, sure, we might be bold as Christians for the Lord when we go street preaching uh, with our brethren around. But the sad thing is, uh, a lot of us is getting to a point where us Christians can't be bold for the Lord Jesus Christ with our brethren with us. And that's the sad thing. Is that you today, folks? Is that you today? We need to start to reflect on some things in our life, whether it's our boldness in our life or, or some areas in our weak points in our life. We need to reflect on it, and then we need to work on it. And maybe some of you today are, are bold for, for the Lord, for your family members and to your, uh, your friends out there. Uh, and that's a great thing. But maybe some of you are uh, bold to uh, more strangers, more strangers than your family members. And that's a problem. If that's the case, why, why would you not be bold for the Lord, for your, your friends and your family members? It's like, it's like a young child and he has a daddy and he loves his daddy so much, right? And all he wants to do is brag and tell about his uh, friends and everything of how great his dad is. How great, oh, my dad does this to me and uh, he's a firefighter, whatnot. But you know what that daddy is? He's just, a, he's not holy. He's just a sinner, right? But we got a father up in heaven that is holy, that is just and is righteous and that his mighty hand has has got us in our hands. Amen. amen. And he's going to lead us through. He's going to provide us. But the sad thing is, I think a lot of us, as we get closer to the end these last days, I think our filling power of the Spirit has lost in us. And we don't have to be that. The Lord can still use San Jose Bible Baptist Church in a mighty way. He can still use BBCI in a mighty way. He can still use Gorski's Church in a mighty way. And Stevenson's Church in a mighty way. We can still be used in these last days. My third point is, encouraging others others with boldness. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 51. I hope you guys turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 51. And this is talking about uh, David and he, uh, he killed Goliath. Uh, verse 51, it reads, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Now look what happened when uh, the men of Israel, when David conquered and killed Goliath. What did the, look at verse 52 to what happened when David was bold for the Lord. Verse 52, and the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted, Aah! and, uh, and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Sharam, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. Now church, when you start being bold for the Lord, you'll start to notice your fellow brethren around you. They'll start to follow along with you. And they'll start to be bold with you. And some of you that are older in the Lord as well, you have an opportunity to show your boldness to these young kids right here, these young teens right here, and us babes in Christ. We're looking up to you. Amen. And some of you uh, that are babes in Christ, you also can be a blessing to these people that are older in the Lord as well and encourage them as well. Amen. And but folks, when we start to be bold for the Lord and we're working together like a unit, we'll start to see amazing things that the Lord does. When we all go to street preaching together, we'll see lost souls get saved, amen. When we start to go to street preaching, we'll see lost souls get saved. You don't have to be a lukewarm Christian. Do something for the Lord, amen. The Lord brought you. He brought you to a Bible-believing church. Let's start acting like it, right? Right? We don't have to be lukewarm. Folks, you can be an affection in the church. For example, people start to notice, wow, Jared Kwong, man, he hasn't been bold for the Lord as much as he used to be. And they'll start to notice in the church, and pretty soon that infection can happen, folks. That infection can happen and spread. And we as lukewarm Christians, many souls won't get saved. We won't be a, a soul-winning church anymore. We need help. We need, we need to be more bold together. Maybe uh, some of us haven't been bold for the Lord so that we can all be bold, more bold for the Lord together. Amen. Let's start doing the simple things and we'll be surprised of what the Lord can do. And uh, I know a lot of us are fired up during this uh, uh, summer camp and everything and it's a blessing. And, uh, but folks, you can't take San Jose Bible Baptist Church with you. 
You can't take the members from San Jose Bible Baptist Church. You can't take the members from BBCI with you. You can't take summer camp with you. The Lord has called you to your own local assembly where he's called you. And you have an opportunity to be bold for the Lord, for your brethren. And you'll start to see them follow along with you. Just like Brother Rob at In-N-Out, he encouraged me. And uh, he's like, hey, let's go pass some tracks. And that's all it took, folks. We got to be bold for the Lord. And uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. I'll close here. And uh, this verse has uh, been a complete blessing to me, especially in my early uh, stages in my walk with the Lord. And it's encouraged me with my boldness for the Lord. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1, it reads, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's what it should be. Come on. Paul didn't know anything. Save Jesus Christ. We just have to be willing for the Lord, folks. And he will move. He will move. That's all I got, folks. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I didn't really get to tie myself, so it might run a little long. It might run a little short. I don't know. We'll see. Okay? All right. So I got three points for you today. And today I want to talk about I want to talk about forgiveness a little bit. Okay, so everybody turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. All right, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels, mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. I'll get to the other verse later. That was verse 12. Sorry, should I have waited? Uh, I'll get to verse 13 in a little bit. All right, but anyway, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to get to it. So, if you want to be used for God, right, you got to be in your best shape, right? And if you want to be in your best shape, you can't have anything holding you back. So, that's what I want to talk about today. So, the title of my message is called, First, Comma, Forgive. So, to do anything, you got to be able to forgive, right? You, you got to do it for your own sake. So, one time somebody said to me, you don't forgive somebody for their sake, you do it for your own sake, right? And I heard a quote, uh, bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die from it. Right? So you don't want bitterness to affect you. So I want to talk about bitterness slash forgiveness. So I want this to be a little encouraging to you guys. So it's all up to you and your mindset. Right? So point number one, you got to, this is in quotes, quotations, forgive God. Obviously God doesn't need your forgiveness, but quote unquote, forgive God. Okay? So I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 11 through 12. I'm just going to start reading. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son, in whom he delighteth. Now, when you're a child, you might have gotten um, disciplined. Some of you might have gotten beaten, right? And your father and your mother, they do that because they don't hate you because they love you, right? They want you to get right. And the Bible says that God does the same thing, right? I like Brother Daniel's preaching yesterday. God gives you what you need, right? You don't want to be beat. You don't want God to chastise you. You don't want God to take away your job, your money, your family, whatever, your health. But sometimes you need it, right? God gives you what you need, right? And we don't always want it, but we need it. So when we're a child of God, we are a child of God and God chastens us, right? But just because of that, we can't be a better at God. A lot of times we can't do that, right? God might take away something that's very important to us. Maybe he wanted to get our attention, right? Yes. Or maybe he wants it to be a good testimony to other people, yes. right? And that's what we need to realize. We can't get better at God. No. Right. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Amen. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation also, make a way to escape that he may be able to bear it. God is never going to give you something that you can't handle, yeah, right? Yeah. And I'm referencing other people's preachings as well. You, you, got, you have what you need, right? Yes. God is giving you what you need. What you need to do is you need to trust the process, right? Yeah. God knows the bigger picture, but you don't know the bigger picture. Yeah. What you see is a little right. snippet of what's in front of you, yeah. right? Yeah. So you need to trust God. You need to trust the process Amen. that God knows what's Amen. good for you and that what he's doing what's best for you. Right. 
And at the end of the day, though, what's encouraging is that even though that's what he's doing, he's not going to give you more than you can handle. If you can only handle this much, he's only going to give you this much. If you can handle this much, you, he's only going to give you that much. So he's never going to give you more than you can handle. So always look inward, right? So God loves you and always, as long as you're willing to be used by God, you're in his goodwill. And God's not going to give you more than you can handle. All right, point number one done. Point number two, right? Point number two is forgive your brethren, right? Uh, I told you that I'm going to return to the other verse. Colossians chapter um, 3, verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Right. So I'm going to separate this point into two different categories, right? You got to forgive your brethren. Amen. And a lot of times in churches, in any churches, even including Bible-believing churches, you get offended. And you get offended for a lot of stuff. Right, right. The first category is you get offended for things you shouldn't get offended about. Amen. Right? Amen. Exactly. For example, you, you go to church, right? You, don't, um, you run into somebody, you say hi to them, they don't say hi back, right? <laughs> you get offended. I mean, it's hurt. it can be hurtful, right? And, um, and, or maybe you go, to, uh, you go to church, you sit in the same seat every day, but somebody came and took your seat that day. You get offended, <laughs> right? <laughs> or Whoa. you were sitting and a, and a preacher came up here and preached about something that pricked you. You got offended at the preacher, oh, right? Or maybe the pastor's wife scolded you for something, for oh, something that you did wrong, and you get offended, yeah. right? So you get offended for a lot of reasons, but these reasons are things you shouldn't get offended about. Because right. yeah. yeah. most of the, um, I was blessed enough to be at this church for a little over 20 years now, oh, yeah. and what I've seen from my experience, 99.9% .9 of those times that you were offended by those things, that person wasn't even thinking that. Right. That person was probably having a bad day, yeah. That person was probably thinking about something he or she has to do for work. So he didn't notice you there, yeah. right? Yeah. And he didn't mean to ignore you, right? He didn't mean to take your seat. He, she probably didn't know, right? Yeah. Maybe yeah. she was a newcomer. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. If you get offended, that's a problem. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. well, you, don't, you, you can't get offended at that kind of stuff. But I, I spent too, too much time on that. What I really want to talk about is when you, sh when you have reason to be offended, right? A brother or sister does something wrong to you. Right? Yeah. They did something, maybe they wrong. sinned, they did something wrong, and you, are right, you have every right to be offended, right? But God tells us to forbear one another, and we have to forgive one another. That's good. That's yeah. good. Right. Yeah. So this is the category that actually matters. But you got to remember, they're humans. So are you, right? They make mistakes. You make yeah. mistakes to them. They, pro they probably have something they're offended about about you, right? Yeah. you got you to understand that. So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. Am I talking too fast? Good. Okay. Prosecute us, brother. <laughs> 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 All right, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, verse, uh, verses 21 and 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Yeah, right? So we're all brothers in Christ here. I know this is a very cliche thing to say, but it needs to be said. Right? We're all brothers in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're yeah. supposed to love each other. You, maybe you don't like each other, yeah. right? Maybe if you met out in the world, your personalities don't match. You don't particularly yeah. like each other, but you should love each other, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit of story. So when, when I was little, when my brother and I fought, my uh, mom used to punish, oh, well, she hit us too, but other than that, uh, <laughs> other than that, she uh, used to punish us in a very special way. She used to have us hug each other, and she used to have us, I don't know, for, I don't know for a long time, for how long? But it was a long time. Right. She, and she used to uh, have us say in Korean, 우리는 형제다, which means we are brothers. Right? And we had to repeat it over and over. Oh, that's good. Uh, psychological torture. But, uh, no, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. But no, but it, it, it's supposed to bring it, that was the idea at least. It was supposed to bring it together, right? So you got to stick together, right? You got to love each other, right? Because you're not... <laughs> so, you're not supposed to be divided. Where there aren't many of us here, right? Especially in these last days, right? We have just a couple of churches, just a, just a few Bible-believing churches just here in California, right? We, we really have to stick together. We have to love each other because the primary way that the devil will get to you is making uh, inside fighting. Yeah. Right. That's the, that's the best way to get to anybody. Any yeah. when you're fighting a war, if you get the other team to fight against itself, you don't have to do anything. Yeah. Right. So that's that's what the devil wants. So when you feel wrong, just think to yourself, hey, when I wronged Jesus Christ, did he feel this way? 
Or when you feel, or the, when I wronged my parents when I was little, did they feel this way? When I wronged my pastor, did they feel this way? You got to ask yourself that. And uh, the answer is they forgave you, right? So you should too. Amen. Right. Yeah. right. And bro like Brother Rob preached the other day, or yesterday actually, this fight is bigger than everyone, right? This yeah. fight is bigger than everybody. You got to trust the process. Like I said before, you got to trust the process and you got to stick together, right? Because these are the last days and you really have to stick together. And the devil's always going to try to attack you with bitterness, right? Bitterness is always going to be there for good reasons or bad reasons, right? Illegitimate reasons or good reasons. Like, there's always going to be bitterness, but it's up to you to overcome that. Because bitterness will destroy you. Bitterness will get to you. And like I said, we've seen way too many people who, typically when people leave the church, it's because of bitterness and pride. And bitterness will, it may not, you may not notice it at first, but it's going to pile up. And by the time that it's too big, you, it's too late, right. Yeah. right? And you've already hurt way too many people in the church. So it will hurt other people, and we've got to keep that in mind. You, the Bible says that you have to forgive your brethren, so please do that, right? Third verse, am I, oh, I'm, I'm good, right? Okay, last, for, or sorry, last point, forgive yourself. Yeah. Right, you got to forgive yourself. All right, first John chapter, uh, turn to first John chapter one, verse nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just Amen. to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right? Many times Christians get stumbled because they can't forgive themselves. Right? Now, this is, I'm, I'm assuming everybody's saved here. And after you get saved, let's say that you sin, you feel so bad. You feel so bad and you get stumbled because of that. Right? You start thinking, I'm not good enough. Right? I, I, I'm, just a, I'm just a burden to everybody else. When I go to church, other people have to help me. Well, I can't help them. Right. You start thinking that because you're a sinner, but, and that makes sense, right? And to be honest, that's probably a better thing to feel than nothing at all, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if you're cold and you don't get affected by anything, then that's a, that's a whole nother issue. Yeah. But there are Christians wow. who get stumbled because they can't forgive themselves, but Jesus Christ already forgave you, right? As long as you confess your sins, I'm not saying you're not going to get punished. You might still get punished, right? But you sin, you might still get punished, and hopefully it's something small, right? Pray for that. But, um, yeah. Yes. But many, uh, but because Jesus Christ already forgave you, assuming that you, you know, repented with all of your heart, Jesus Christ already forgave you, so you should too, right? Jesus forgave you, so why can't you? Oh, right. Jesus was more offended by your sin than you, and right. He forgave yeah. you. So just forgive yourself. You needed to be able to do that. Why? Because if you don't, you hurt the body of Christ, right? The body, we are the body of Christ. If you're saved, you're in the body of Christ. Like, uh, many preachers have gone over this before, but every part of the body of Christ is so important. It's not just the eyes or the nose or the feet or the hands that are important or the brain or the head. Everybody's important, right? For example, if you're a, um, like, a, like a hair in your nostril, right? You serve a purpose because you prevent dust from getting into your nostrils, right? And whoever the nose is, that person will appreciate you, right? <laughs> so if you're in the body of Christ, you are important. I'm not trying to co well, contradict what Brother Jay said earlier. This is assuming you're in the body of Christ and, you, and you're in God's will, right? Amen. If you're not, then you are basura, right? <laughs> you're not important. But if you're in God's will, you're doing His will, you are important. Yes. And you yeah. need to know that. So you need to forgive yourself and you need to let yourself be a blessing to other people yeah. as well. Wow. Right? So you are not used to So get over yourself and pick yourself back up and Amen. brush off the dirt and you got to keep fighting. Yeah. Right? So Amen. these are the last days and your pastors can really use your help. So yeah. you really got to pick yourself up and do not let yourself become a discouragement to them. Amen. Thank you. Amen. That's it. Amen. It's going up over a hundred now. Oh man, help me, Lord. Amen. All right, let's turn to Ephesians chapter four, verse thirty. Oh man, I don't think I've ever been this nervous. I don't know why I'm so nervous today. Uh, Ephesians chapter four, verse thirty. It's going to be simple, but it's it's a reminder that I think we all need. Uh, this has been something that's been very personal to me in the recent years of my Christian life, and I pray and hope that this will help you. And just to give a disclaimer. When I preach this message, I'm not, I'm not only preaching to everybody, but against myself as well. Please keep that in mind. Um, so the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The word that really popped up to me in this verse is the word grieve. Now, I went to the Webster's 1820 Dictionary to actually define this because I think definitions are very important. The definition of grief, as said in the 1828, is the pain of mind produced by loss, misfortune, injuries, or evils of any kind, sorrow, regret. We experience grief when we lose a friend, when we incur loss, when we consider ourselves injured, and by sympathy, we feel grief at the misfortunes of others. 
let me, give you, let me tell you why grief is important. Researchers at Rice University in 2018 reported that grief can cause up to 17% increased inflammation in grieving individuals. Oh, yeah. mm. simply, say, simply said, any disease you get older is made worse by inflammation, which in turn makes it more likely that you're going to die. Mm. It's that important. Why am I talking about this? Well, our God is one that feels grief. He knows what grief is. Jesus, or Jesus in John chapter 11, verse 35, he weeps at the death of Lazarus, right? And, the, and it's the shortest verse in the Bible from what I understand. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Because he knows what grief is. He knows what sadness is. And he genuinely felt sad and it destroyed his heart that Lazarus died. Okay, I only have one point. Grief is no joke. That's, the, my, that's my first and only point. And I know this is overused, but when we sin, we don't just hurt ourselves. We hurt everybody around us. But most importantly, you hurt God who lives inside of you. Yeah. The problem is when we, when we sin, we never think about God. We always think about ourselves and what we want to do. And what happens? You go and you commit the same sin you've been committing. And then what happens? When you're done, I hope you're not in this place. But you don't feel anything. It's just a, it's just a course of action. It's a habit. And it's been so ingrained in our flesh that we think nothing of it. But we can't forget. The Lord is inside you. He's watching you. And He's forced to do the same thing that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. He has to do whatever dirty, wicked thing that we think and do. And we put Him in that position. And you know what? That's the only time God's helpless. He can't change your free will. When Pastor Gene preached that message, it changed me. Because he said... Freedom is your freedom, freedom of choice is the only thing that God cannot overturn. He can't keep you from going in one direction or the other. That's the whole point of salvation, right? It's by choice. Yes. He's not a Calvinist. Right. He's not going to keep you from sinning, or he's, gonna, he's not going to keep you from not sinning, right? He's going to let you do it, or you're going to choose to not do it. He can't stop your free will. And you grieve him because of that. Have you ever lost a family member and felt that pang in your heart? Has it ever dropped? Has it ever torn you up from the inside and you can't stop thinking about it? Grief is, that's the word grief. You grieve when your family member's dead. But here it says, you grieve the Spirit of God when you sin. He feels that every time you, have, you do something bad. And he can, you can't stop it. He can't stop you. So he's forced to bear that every single time. Maybe that's the closest thing that we can get to imagining how it feels like to put Jesus on the cross. Because every time you swear, every time you have a wicked thought, every time you go back to the same habit, he's tearing up inside. He's crying. He's screaming out. Hey, I know you shouldn't go that way. I've been telling you. Your pastor's been telling you. Your brethren have been telling you. I've been telling you through the Bible. Hey, son, don't go that way. I know where you're going is treacherous. It's a, it's a thorn-covered path. You're going to get thorns all over you. You're going to have to pull them out. And when I have to pull them out, when I punish you by pulling it out, it's going to hurt because I have to chastise you. And He can't stop you. That's the hardest part. He can't stop you. And if you're so set on your way that you're going to go that way, nothing's going to stop you. In fact, the devil's going to help you. He's going to say, hey, here you go. Here's the alcohol. Here's this. Here's X, Y, and Z. Here's the TV. Here are all the friends that you need. Here's the money. Go enjoy yourself. Because he doesn't care about you. But God does. And Jesus Christ did. When he died for you and he bled for you, he cared for you. He cared about your sins. And because of that, he was willing to suffer that. Can you imagine hanging by the wrist on a cross? I can't imagine it. I got pricked by a thorn the other day. I was like, man, that hurts. I was out over there hiding from Pastor Stevenson and all the other preachers. What happened? I just sat on a couple of leaves that had some spiky tips and it hurt me. And I said, oh, wow, that hurts. I'm, I'm kind of wimp, okay? I'm, I'm frail. You guys all know that I have health problems and all that. But it hurt me. But the worst thing to Jesus Christ and the spirit inside of me and the Lord God is not the physical pain that he had to endure on the cross. It's the fact that he has to sit and watch you sin. It's the fact that he can't get away from it. And he was willing to bear for our sakes. But why do we have to make it go through it again? And again. And again and again. We're saved now. We have the power to overcome it. It's just that we don't want to listen. 
and I know it's the struggle is real. It is difficult when you have something that has a grip on you. When, I, when you have a sin that's just, it's got you in its clenches. It's hard to get away. And I'd be lying if I told you it wasn't hard. But brethren, we have the Holy Spirit in you. The same being that has to watch your sin can also help you overcome it. Amen. Let me give you an illustration from my own life. When we, were in our, when we were in our high school years, my brother went down the wrong path. And he knows it. He'd come home drunk. He'd smoke weed. And you know what? The only thought I had was, it was I, I had anxiety. I was anxious that he would do something, he would mess up, or he'd get caught by the cops, and he'd have to go to prison. I was worried that he'd do something while he was drunk that he would regret, that would haunt him for the rest of his life. I feared for that. And you know what? I told him, hey, you shouldn't do this. But hey, it's okay. I'm doing it in moderation. Just like those dumb Christians say, oh, it's okay. You can drink wine in moderation. You don't think that's a gateway to other addictions and other drugs and whatnot? You really think so? They, they'll quote 1 Timothy 4, 8, and that is the thing that makes me the most angry. It makes me grab my hair and just want to pull it out. Actually, it makes me want to grab their hair and pull it out. <laughs> Amen? It makes me angry because I know the damages it can do. I'm sure there are other brethren here that can definitely testify the damages that alcohol and drugs can do. See, I get amens from the crowd all over the place, yet there are people doing that. I was watching my brother, and I couldn't, I couldn't help it. I couldn't stop him. I, I was forced to watch. And it hurt me too. Because I love my brother. I don't want him to go down there. Yeah. It's not easy to watch somebody that's your family member yeah. go down the wrong path. Yeah. And it really hurts. Yeah. And we're doing the same thing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we do something. We have to understand that. We can't forget. We come to camp and when we get home, we forget about it two weeks later. We go back to the same thing. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, hey, why are you doing that? I told you, I'm, I'm trying to show you. It's been 10 years. How long will it take? How long do I have to cry for you? He shouldn't have to cry for us anymore. It should be over when we get off this mountain. But I know you're going to struggle. And we all do. And here's the solution. In camp, our memory verses are Ephesians, yeah. Ephesians chapter 6. That's a key, that's a key point that will help you overcome your sins. Next one is Romans chapter 6. Yes. That's the next thing that can help you. Amen. When you think about it, just, if you have the urge to sin, think about the Lord Jesus Christ crying in front of you. Then think about your flesh. Hey, this thing is rebelling against me. Yeah. Just take a moment to pause and just think and just realize that you're in a spiritual battle. Yeah. Sometimes that's all it takes. But if you don't do that, you're going to repeatedly crucify Jesus Christ. Mm. That's it. You know, I want to witness to my dad and get him saved. I tried. He still won't listen, but I'm, tr I'm still trying. I'm still praying. Amen. I'm not losing hope. Amen. Lord is great. I don't, he works in mysterious ways. Amen. He's smoking. He recently got diagnosed with diabetes. His, one of his eyes are going, he's going blind in one of his eyes. And I can't stop him because no matter how many times I tell him, I can't override his free will. I can't. And I have to watch him suffer. And perhaps until the end of his life. But I don't want to do that to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope you don't either. Amen. That's all I got for you. If you have your Bibles, go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Sorry, I didn't know I was going to preach today, so my voice is kind of, you know, all this screaming. Yelling, but I pray that the Lord just helps me with it and um, gives me the strength. Um, yeah, if you have your Bibles, go to Colossians chapter 2. And, and verse 8, and this one really speaks to me because I've seen a lot of Christians leave because of this. And I'm going to read it. And it says, beware, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you've given me, Lord, and thank you for just showing me who you are and always being there for me, being a father for me when I didn't have anyone to go to, being my guide when I have no one to turn to. And Father, thank you, Lord, for letting me have a taste of what you went through. Let me suffer and let me go through some things. And when I go to someone else and I can talk to them and be able to smile and say, I know what you went through and I can tell you what Jesus Christ went through for you. And it just breaks my heart and I'm glad that I'm able to just come before you and still worship you. 
Father, we don't deserve to be here. We don't deserve to even say your name. But, Father, I just pray that you give me the words to help some of these people. Some of these men and some of these women, they don't have family they, that are saved. Some of them are, have lost family members. Some of them are alone. And all they have is their church. And, Father, I just pray that this message will just be able to encourage them to keep on going and not turn to the world. Father, I pray that you just help me. Give me the strength to only lift you up and you only, for I am nothing I am wretched and I am vile. Father, thank you for who you are, Lord, and I really love you. Thank you for taking me in when no one else wanted to take me in. I remember those days, Father, that they were right. I was dirty. I was a dirty kid, but you took me in, even though I don't deserve it. Father, I just pray that you help me. Lord, give me the strength. And I pray all this in Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. I'm going to give you some stories of the Bible that have really spoke to me. And some of them we already talked about. The first one I'm going to give you is um, the Mary. Brother Jay, I'm not going to get into it that much, but Brother Jay preached on it. And I think of the things that she went through and she had the alabaster box. She put all of her savings, everything that she owned, knowing that if something were to happen to her, she could be in a financial mess. And she broke it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what broke me was that when I read it, that there was someone else saying to Mary, oh, I could have used it for someone that was poor. We could have used it for someone that was poor. And one thing that was able to encourage me, when the Lord Jesus Christ said, let her alone. Amen. And I love you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you have given your all for Christ. And you may have a brother, a sister, a family member that is going against you. And isn't it a blessing when God comforts you? Amen. And he says, let him alone. Let her alone. And one thing that I just love about that story is that Mary, she still kept on washing and just keep on anointing the Lord Jesus Christ and just crying. She didn't care what they had to say. She wasn't bad or what, the, what Judas had to say. Yeah, Judas, you'll use it for the poor. What did you do at the end, Judas? Betray Jesus Christ. Betray Jesus Christ. Yeah, use it for the poor. Use it for how you want. But Mary, she didn't give up. She just kept on going. She wasn't out there cooking all the time. One thing you see about Mary, she was always wanting to listen to Jesus Christ. She was always at his feet, wanting to do something more. Maybe she may not have been out there cooking it, but she loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. She wanted to give him everything that she had, and she was crying. And I love what Brother Jay just said. Towards the end of his message, break the alabaster box before it's too late. The time is coming. Jesus Christ is coming soon. And the next one, I, the first point is that they will say is they will tell you, don't give it your all. But I'm telling you, oh Christian, give it your all. The Lord will take care of you. You know, I could say this. I've been homeless three times in my life. And I had someone say, you know what, Nathan? Where was God when he was supposed to supply for your needs? And I told that person, what I needed right now is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that, but man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. I don't need the food. I don't need anything. I need Jesus Christ. Amen. And as I go on, I said, I need to suffer so I can see what my Savior went through for me. And it breaks me and it shows me that, why? I'm filthy. I'm vile. You're vile. You're filthy. But Christ still took it for you. And yet you're still holding back that box. You got a college degree to go out and pursue. You got a job that you got to pursue. You got something that you got to pursue. But you won't give your all for the Lord Jesus Christ. You can only live for yourself. Only what you want. Not what for Christ. And the second point I'm going to give to you is that the philosophy of this world tells you is you got to experience the world. And the one that I'm going to use on this one is the prodigal son. We don't have time to get there right now, but if you go in Luke, Luke chapter 16, I believe you can read it on your own. But then I think of this man. He goes up to his father and says, give me my inheritance. And he's out there saying, I want my inheritance. I'm going to live the way that I want to live. But I wonder who was the one that told him that. You see the older brother towards the end of the story saying, oh, you, you're going to give this your, your son all this, where's my stuff at? 
He spent his substance on harlots. But I find it interesting, if you read that chapter, it doesn't say that he spent his substance on harlots. It's probably what that son would have done, the older brother. That's what he probably would have done, but not the little brother. I don't know exactly what he did. He spent it in riotous living. But then I see this man. One thing that I love about the prodigal son is that he came back. Amen. He came back. And not many of you guys, if you go to a far off country, you won't come back. You know, I've seen so many people say that, you know, I got saved when I was seven years old. I got saved when I was eight years old. I got saved when I was nine years old, but they're all gone. Yeah. I've noticed, too, as you get older, you're more apt to fall. Some of the elderly people that I used to remember as a young, they used to be strong. And now they're using a walker. You're more apt to fall. So right here are the prodigal son. He's now coming back. And one thing that he, I admire about him is that I've sinned against heaven and against God. I've sinned against my father and against heaven. And as he's going out there, he's, he was already coming back. And one thing that I love is when the father comes out and he looks at his son and he runs up to him and he kisses him. And one thing he does, he's just crying and weeping. And he doesn't ask, what have you been? What have you been doing? What did you spend the money on? You know, and he says, oh, then my son is home. And sometimes I love it because the older brother is out there talking bad about his little brother. And sometimes when we go before the father, the devil is right there saying, you remember what you have done? Remember what you were? Remember what kind of sinner that you were? But Jesus Christ said, it is pain and full. He is I'm thankful for that, that we have a father that could do go out there and just hold us and doesn't look at our flaws. Oh, yeah. If you want someone that loves you, it is Christ. He knows all about your flaws. He knows all about your wickedness, all about your sin, who you are. And he still died for you. Yeah. And he still loves you. Amen. The prodigal son came back. Don't be like that, man. And if you're that, if you're that brother that's talking about someone else, you want nothing to do with that, that prodigal son that come back, then send him my way. I want to love him. I want to tell them more about Christ. I know exactly what they were going through. I've seen so many people go out in the way, and when they come back, they don't want them to be there. But the Father takes them back. But why can't we? Uh, father, the father loves them, but we don't. The next point I'm going to go up to you is that the philosophy of this world tells you that you need to loosen up a bit. The third point is loosen up a bit. And this one I'm going to talk to you about is David. I'm going to talk to you about King David. If you could go to me, I'll read just the first verse and I'll go into the story. Um, 2 Samuel 2 Samuel, chapter 12. 2 Samuel, chapter 12. I'm sorry, 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 1. 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the times when the kings go forth into battle, to battle, that David sent Joab and his servant with them, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. You know, I just said right now, as the older you get, you're more apt to fall. David right now, he's probably thinking, I run my battles. I've won my battles. I'm going to put down the sword. And I'm going to go on and do what I want to do. I'm going to loosen up a bit. I'm going to do what I want to make, whatever makes me happy. And some of the things that breaks my heart is when a Christian says that. I was never happy being a Christian. And I'm going to live my life the way I want to live. And I see them living in sin and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. 
And right here we go on is David put down that sword. You know what ends up happening? He goes on in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life kicks in. And he looks up there and he sees Bathsheba. And the Holy Spirit is ready to convict him. That's Uriah's wife. You should not be touching him. Touch, going looking at her. And all of a sudden he goes out and calls for a messenger. And he says, give me Bathsheba. And the messenger brings Bathsheba, and the messenger tells David, isn't this Uriah the Hittite tribe? And David still takes her. But one of the things that's even going on is that even though David is going on through this sin, this presumptuous sin, knowing that he's sinning against God, knowing that he's given the nations to blaspheme God, he still goes on. All because he loosened up. Now let me ask you this. You want to go out there and sin. You want to go out there and live in the world. Then you're going to live a life that you will have consequences of sin. You're going to make some regrets. Things that will haunt you. And I think right here as David loosened up. Let me ask you this. Do you think he would care? You ask him, David, would you change some things? Would you change some things if you were to go back and do some things? I'm sure he would. He had to see his son die out there screaming and crying, Absalom, Absalom. And the Joab has to come up to him and says, what are you doing? Man, the consequences of sin and seeing his family break apart. I wonder what Absalom thought of him. It's a mark, it's a blot. You took Uriah's wife, you killed Uriah, you killed Bathsheba, you took Bathsheba. It was a blot. He chose to continue and, and just continue to do a sin, commit a sin. And he gave the reasons for the other nations to blaspheme God. And I just want to end it with just one missionary that I really admire, who gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to end it with his story. Aniram Judson. How many of you guys know Aniram Judson? Man, you, got, you have to read his biography. I was just reading it and it was just... Really amazing. This man, he was a pastor's kid, but one day he decided, I'm going to go out and live the way that I want to live. He finally told his dad, you know what, dad, I'm a deist. I don't believe in your God. I don't believe in your Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe what you have to tell me. I'm going to go out there to New York, and I'm going to go out there and pursue a theatrical career. I'm going to become the best. I graduated valid Victorian. And as he graduated, he had a best friend. And during that time, as his best friend was out there, they were going to go to New York together. And they were at a hotel. I mean, he was at a hotel going to meet his best friend. And all of a sudden, he hears someone coughing and coughing at nighttime. And the innkeeper says, you know, there's only one room for you. And that room is only for, is next to the person that's sick. And the doctor's going to be coming in and out. And you have to be listening to that coughing. Are you sure you want to listen? You want to stay at this inn? So Adoniram Judson says, yeah, I'm going to stay with this inn, at this inn. I'm going to go meet my friend, and we're going to go out there and pursue something big. And as Adoniram Judson is going out there, and he's listening in his room, and he's hearing the coughing, and he's thinking, what if I were to die? What if that was me? Did everything that my dad say was true? Would I be in the lake of fire? Then he laughs it off and says, what would my best friend think of me if he knew that I had these thoughts? So he laughs it off and he says, I'm going to go to sleep. So he goes to sleep and he wakes up in the morning. The coughing is stopped. And Adoniram Judson wakes up and he asks the innkeeper, says, what happened to that man? And the innkeeper said, oh, the man passed away. And he said, it was a young man. He was on his way to New York City. And Adoniram Judson asked, what was his name? And the innkeeper gave his name. And it was his best friend. Adoram Judson just broke down and he said, probably this isn't all what it's cut out to be. I got invited in Victorian in my school and I'm gonna go pursue a career, but probably this isn't all there is to life. Adoram Judson ended up going back home and he told his parents and he ended up getting saved. And you know what ends up happening from then on? He gives his life to the Lord. He was a first American missionary. He goes out there and people were opposed to him saying, you can't go to the Burmese people. You're not going to go there. He had a wife right there, Sarah Hudson. And she gave his, her life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the ministry, she died 
right after he gets out of prison. He had to bury 10 children on the mission field. He had to bury another wife. And he still stuck it out. Amen. He didn't leave the ministry. Amen. All because he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't listen to the philosophy of the world saying, I'm going to go become a theatrical whatever he wants to do. No, he turned around and said, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. If I have to bury some family members, then I'll bury some family members. And I love what he said. He's told his, as he was writing his biography, he said, I want my kids to be martyrs for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want my kids to live a life that is suffering so that they can grow closer to Christ. I don't want them to pursue a worldly career that will draw them away from Christ. And that man lived it as an example for his kids. And that's all I have to share with you. All right. So, not much of a preacher, but um, got a short notice to preach. So, until the pastor tells you to do something, you do it, right? Amen. And <clears throat> so, I, I was thinking, so I'm not much of a preacher, like I said. And so, what am I going to talk about? So, I thought I'd just share uh, what I noticed uh, myself during, uh, during this week, myself, what I've been realizing, what I've been learning myself. And... As I've been um, looking at the kids, taking care of the kids a little bit, um, just when I say take care, telling kids what to do. And <laughs> <clears throat> let's, surf, let's just first do uh, Mark 1230. We're going to go back to the beginning, back to, back to basics today. 1230. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Yes. Amen. So I want to focus on <clears throat> what I've seen in the kids, the positive attributes of the kids that I've seen, uh, <clears throat> that I've seen among the babes uh, this week. Um, the ugly side is uh, another for a sermon for another day. <laughs> and yeah, so... Been with the kids for three nights. I already know I don't want kids. <clears throat> yeah. But first thing is that they're proud. Of one, one, thing about, one thing about little these babes is that they're proud of what, they've, what you provided them and the, and the achievements that they made through you. If you think about these kids, a lot of things, the typical things that they say is, we all know this. Look, mom. Look, dad. My dad is so-and-so. My mom can do so-and-so. Look what, my dad, look what my dad got me. I memorized 15 verses. I did all this because my mom gave me all this. So that's what I've been thinking. They're proud of all the stuff that our parents uh, gave them. But for us, God gave us so much stuff. Amen. God, just like what Pastor Jinha said the other day in his preaching, we're blessed with so much good stuff within our hands. We're, we have so much good stuff in our hands and we're just letting it go to waste. Amen. Are we eager to share this and brag about what God has provided to us? Amen. Because this salvation, this good stuff that God has provided us is not finite. It's not, fi it's not a consumable. We take it, we share it, it gets bigger. It's, I know it's so cliche, but it does get bigger. Do we have more fun when we have a uh, small, smaller amount of people in our summer camp? Or do we have more fun when we have this big of amount of people in the summer camp? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a consumable. <clears throat> and when we, uh, let's go to Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse two uh, verses 2 and 5, 2 through 5. It's talking about the church of Ephesus, but I think it applies to us, because it's basically us. Revelation 2, verses 2 through 5, it says, I know that, uh, the Lord says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how, <clears throat> and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and, they, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for, thy, and, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. 
Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the f first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of, out of his place, except thou repent. So, we are doing a lot of good stuff here. We prepare for each other, we, or we look out for each other, we, t uh, we tell uh, our kids what's good, we prepare food, we help each other out, we set up tables, good works, good work. All good stuff. But God appreciates something else more. God appreciates that too. But there's something else that God prioritizes. And that's your heart. Has it become a work for you guys? That street preaching every Friday. Is that just a mundane weekly routine for you guys? Coming to Wednesday, is that, has that just become a, just another part of you that you just come all oh, Wednesday, 7 o'clock? Time to go to church. Is that just, that's, I'm not saying that's bad, but the priority is that more important thing is that are you doing all that out of voluntary heart, Amen. passion for Christ, Amen. passion to love for Christ? Because I'm not, um, like I said, I'm preaching to myself here. All these work that you do for Christ, it may be little stuff, or it may not be important. Whether it's uploading to uploading videos or just updating web pages, preparing for services, wrapping up after services, all good stuff. I applaud you for that. God appreciates that too. But, but are you doing that because it's just work? Or are you doing that because out of love for Christ? And I want to move on to the second point about the kids that we want to learn, we, I wish I can take away from these uh, babes, is that they absorb everything. Oh, yeah. They absorb everything. They're always curious. They're always eager to learn. They're always passionate. They all, this is the typical thing. They always ask, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> what's it mean? Oh, yeah. And there's the infamous why. Yeah. That, doesn't, uh, that doesn't end. Why, why, why? But the thing is that, yeah, they can be annoying, but you can't hate them for that. They're genuinely curious. They want to learn. They want to absorb everything. Well, this is, a, this is not an excuse for you, that, like what um, we learned last night from Pastor Gorski's questions, uh, Gorski's um, preachings, is that don't be, we, we learned that don't be looking around as uh, wrong stuff. But then you don't use this as an excuse, saying, "Oh, isn't asking questions a good thing?" No, it's no, no, no. You know the yes, difference. Yeah. Be, you know the difference between asking questions out of genuine curiosity, right. mm -hmm. and also questioning authority. Right. Yeah. There is a difference. Yeah, that's good. That's good, man. <clears throat> so, and also when I was um, helping these kids memorize verses, I was I was just dumb as I was. I was saying, "Okay, say it." And they, they fail to say it. And I say, give them back the verses. Read it again and tell them again. If they fail, read it again and tell them again. <laughs> it, was, it was no learning experience at all for these kids. I was, I was just sitting there telling them to memorize, memorize, memorize. But there's this one sister who came. Hey, they're, they're much better at, at listening, did you know, if you knew, than just reading. I was like, oh, that's good. Oh, good tip. OK, pro tips. And I implemented it, and they got better. And I last, later last night, I was preparing this, and something that I was kind of thinking about is that if they're so good at listening and learning by listening, doesn't that also mean they're also susceptible to listening? Be because they're so susceptible to listening, they learn so well. But doesn't that mean if, since they're so good at listening, if they hear something wrong, if they hear something bad, same effect happens. Yeah. Yeah. It impacts oh, you. So I was thinking both ways. What are we saying in front of these kids and as babes ourselves in front of, in front of God's sight, yes. what are we allowing ourselves to go in our ears to impact us? What are we allowing to influence us? So these kids are absorbing everything at all times. And I want to take away that I want to have that kind of attitude towards God and His gifts for us, yeah. all the stuff that He's provided us. We want to absorb everything. Yeah. Yeah. 
but we want to be w watching out for what we absorb though at the same time like Pastor Gina always preaches we want to be dispensational right <laughs> we want to be dispensational in what we accept okay so I want to keep it short just two points they are um, they're proud of what they provided them and the achievements that they uh, made through you and they absorb everything I wish I had that kind of a characteristic when it comes to the stuff that Lord has provided me. But unfortunately, I'm not. Fortunately, we're not. So, in conclusion, I think the only thing that we can do, like as we said in the, um, as we looked at in our two Bible verses that we looked together, we want to go back to our first love. We want to go back to our first love where we had that fire and passion for Christ when we first got saved. Because Yes, I did um, notice in kids where when you give them good stuff, they don't want to share it, right? Yeah. But, I have, but I have never seen in any Christians, when they first got saved, they don't want to keep it to themselves. Yeah. They, were always, yeah. they were always on fire to share it because they, we know it gets bigger, the joy gets bigger when we share it. And we want to go back to that. So we want to reset. We want to reset. What's the best way? What's, what's the first thing that you do when you, uh, when you call up your IT guy and say, hey, my computer's broken? What does he tell you? Reboot your computer. 95% of the time, it, fix, it solves it. It fixes, the, it fixes the solution. Your car breaks down, not all the time, but you restart it, it works. That's why we keep restarting and restarting and restarting, right? So we want, uh, things pile up as we live our lives. Cobwebs pile up. We want to clear that. Yeah. Reset. So, Spiritual reset. that's right. Yeah. It's already Friday in camp, right? But it's not too late to reset. Yeah. Because yeah. this camp is not for you to show off how spiritual you are. Yeah. This camp is for you to come and just rejuvenate. This is not where you get tested. What you do out there is what counts. Oh, yeah. What you do here, you're here to rejuvenate. Yeah. You're here to rejuvenate so you can perform out there. Okay? So what counts up there is how, what you do out there. Yeah. So it's not too late in camp. Oh, it's already Friday. It's, I'm not, I'm just, I'll just stay as is. No. Get right with the oh. Lord. Yeah. Reset. Yeah. Reset. Yeah. Uh, if, you're not a, uh, if you're already not a born-again Christian, I hope this is a moment for you, yes, for you yeah. to reset. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. For you to reset your life, go back to that first love as a babe in Christ. Always be having that desire to learn. Always be absorbent. Amen. And always be proud of all the stuff that God has provided you, that yeah. God has done through you. Amen. And share all that good stuff that God has provided you in your hands. Amen. Because don't let, that go to, don't let that go to waste. Because He will ask up there, What'd you do with all the stuff that I invested yeah. in you? Yeah. How has my investment come out to be? Yeah. Did you lose it? Yeah. Did it stay the same? Was my investment worth it? Should I have invested in someone else? Pray for that. Genesis 32, I think. Amen. It's good to be in camp. Amen. It's good to be saved. It's good to be amongst uh, like-minded believers. Amen. People that love you and pray for you. Your best lost friend in the world could never pray for you. Amen. 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 All right. Genesis 32. Genesis 32. Genesis 32 today and... We'll start in verse 24. Verse 24. Genesis 32. Verse 24. The Bible says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, 
Jacob. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd uh, get me out of the way completely, hide me behind the cross at Calvary, Father. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give these people what you want them to hear today. Don't have me to say anything dumb. Uh, just give it to them how you want it today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So, names have meaning. At least they used to, amen? Now you just make up your own name, I guess. Um, but names have meaning. Jews, historically, were named after uh, their father. You know, Simon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah. Gentiles, they, their last name uh, would come from their hometown or their occupation. Alexander the coppersmith and so on and so forth. We find in Scripture that there are numbers attached to names. Uh, men are named prophetically, and even God Himself intervenes and inserts particular names for particular men. And here we have in this passage one of the best proofs of the importance of a name. For we find that Jacob literally is wrestling with God for a blessing in his life. And it's connected with his name, with his very identity. Are you wrestling with a few things this week at camp? Do you want a blessing this week? If you do want a blessing and you are wrestling with some things, I pray that you'll do like Jacob did and get the blessing by finally answering this question. This is my title. What is thy name? What is thy name? My first point, you must know and say your name. We saw that in verse 27. God's asking Jacob, what is thy name? And he expects an answer. Jacob, most of you know, means supplanter, right? Uh, he, he came along and he supplanted Esau. He took his inheritance. He took his blessing. He robbed him of it. He was a deceiver. And uh, we you can find that over in Genesis 27, 36. Here's a, a free little nugget for you. In, uh, in verse 27, that verse has 13 words in it. What's the number 13? Rebellion. Rebellion. Amen? It's not a good number. What's the 13th word? What's the last word in the verse? Hey, Jacob. How's it going, rebel? How's it going, deceiver? Supplanter? Liar? Yep. Jacob had to come to grips with who he was before he was going to get the blessing. Yep. Jacob, those five letters, right? That was a dead, a dead name, Jacob. God wanted to bless Jacob, but before he would do it, he already knew who Jacob was. He knew Jacob's name. He needed Jacob to know what his name was. Only then would he bless him. Um, don't turn there, but in Mark 5 and Luke 8, we see Jesus again rhetorically asking the question to the maniac of Gadara, what is thy name? He's getting ready to make a change in the maniac of Gadara. He's getting ready to, to, to change him into a man of God. Amen? Amen. He's fixing to do that with some people here today. And, you know, I came kind of halfway through this thing, so I don't know, maybe he's already been doing that with you. Anyone can say, my name's Amen, Lord. My name's Run the Bases. My name's Throw the Shoe. My name's Pet the Rattlesnake, Amen, up till midnight. But it's not until you are alone with God. Well, when you come down from this thing, that you're going to be confronted with that same thing you didn't get right at camp. That's right. Because you were so caught up in the experience of camp oh, that's good that you didn't actually get the thing right. That's good. That's good. That's good. My name's Lawler. Uh, Pastor probably remembers this. My first year coming out on the way back, it was me, him, Sister Iris. I don't know how we got on the topic, but they were trying to teach me some Korean. You know, I was zealous, so I was like, you know, wanted to learn a couple Korean words. And, uh, you know, I, I, Jin Ha truth flowing freely and I was like whoa wow wow that's amazing I wonder what my name means big mistake I think that's why the New Testament says to stay away from genealogies amen so I look it up you know my full name is James Sean Patrick Lawler and so I'm like wow James I got that one in the book you know that's King James Sean that you could trace that back to John you know God's gift amen amen you know Patrick, you know, oh man, Patrick of, of Ireland, you know, get those Catholics out of there, you know. And then I got to Lawler, and 
the, to the best of my abilities, I could trace Lawler back to, it means half leper. <laughs> half leper. Not Gene Ha, truth flowing freely, amen? I don't even want to know what Gorski means, amen? I got, I got my own problems, amen? <laughs> Brethren, and amen, right? I'm glad, man, I only got half leper. I don't know what full leper is, but thank God I only got half leper. But brethren, you need to know what that thing is about that old nature, that old name of yours before you got saved, that's those tendencies you have, the, the way that the flesh fights against you. We all have different ways. You need to know that guy and you need to say it to God this week. If you haven't already, maybe you're wrestling. I hope to God he hasn't had to touch the hollow of your thigh yet. Amen? But some of you he has and some of you he will because you won't say the name. God knows the name, you know the name, but you won't say it. Jacob said it, amen? My second point, you must say no to your name. Not only must you know and say your name to God, you must then say no to your name. Look in verse 28. So following verse 27, you know, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. <laughs> and he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob but Israel. Brethren, Lawler? You're looking at Sean Lawler. I'm not Sean Lawler. <laughs> That's not my name. That's the old guy's name. Yeah. Like Brother Gorski, yeah. I, 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 he was saying one time with those, uh, that old crowd he used to run with, you know, lose my number. I'm dead. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, you know, Lawler, if it wasn't bad enough, it means half leper. I got the last name Lawler actually from my mother. Lawler is my mother's maiden name. Her and my father never married. And around the time I was born, behind my father's back, she put Lawler on the birth certificate. So, that's great. So I'm a bastard. I was born a bastard. I was born illegitimately out of wedlock. So I always hated that name. I, always want, I think there's something natural in a, a son wants the name of his father. Amen? Plus, my dad had a cool last name, O'Shea. You know, wow. So Irish, you know. I was all proud of being Irish, yeah. Um, man, Sean O'Shea. Wow, that just has a nice ring to it, right? Not like Loyler, you know. It's like hard to even say, especially, oh, you know, God help you Koreans trying to say it too, you know. But I hated it. I denied it. I would, I would lie about it. People would ask me what my name was. I, I would lie about it. Oh, Sean O'Shea. There was shame associated with that name for me. I was ashamed of it. I wanted to change it. I was planning uh, for a long time to change it as soon as I was of age. But guess what, brethren? That name was stuck on me. There was no getting it off. And I was a, ba I was a bastard by, uh, just by earthly, e even just secular people, you know, w would think that I, I was a bastard. But what's worse, I was a spiritual bastard. Yeah. I was, an, I, I was illegitimate. I wasn't a child of God. But brethren, I, I, I want you, this is where I'm, go, I'm coming at, where I say I want you to say no to your name. That's not my name anymore. I'm not, I'm not that guy anymore. Yeah. Ephesians 2, 12 and 13 and 18 says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth wealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 18, for through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. I have a Father now. Amen. I, God is my Father. Wow. Amen. 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 No, no more Lawler. Amen. No more Jacob, but, but Israel. And locationally, yes, I'm still Sean Lawler. I'm still in the flesh. As long as I'm down here in the flesh, people are going to know me as Sean Lawler. But legally, that old name is dead. It does not apply to me anymore. Amen. So you might ask me, okay, so then what's your name? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know what it is yet. Uh, but that leads me to my third point. You must see your new name. You must see your new name. Verse 28, look at it again. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Also, don't turn there, Isaiah 62, verses 2 through 4 says, And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. Yeah. Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. Amen. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. Why? For the Lord delighteth in thee. Amen. And thy land shall be married. Revelation 2.17 says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So you ask again, what's my name? I don't know yet. No one knows yet. But I know it's going to be godly. Yeah. I, I know it's going to be from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And guess what? You know what I like about this thing? You can still mock Lawler. You, you can still make fun of me. I can ruin my name. I can ruin Lawler. It, it's it's kind of like the kingdom of heaven, uh, kingdom of God, I guess. It's a physical thing that you could still, you could put my name in the mud. But you can't say a thing about my new name yeah. because no one knows what it is yet. <laughs> and so some of you are going to come away from this thing. You're not going to say what your old name is. You're not going to say to God what that thing is about you that's going to hold you back from Him blessing you once and for all and getting you to that next level. But some of you are just, I'm just a Jacob and there's no way I'm ever going to be anything else. And I'm just deceiver, supplanter Jacob. And, you know, I'm never going to do anything for God. And you, you, God, that name is dead. God killed that name. He has a new name for you, but you're not living like it. You're not looking to that new name. And if you could look to what that new name is, even though we don't know what it is yet, you would see, man, I'm not this guy anymore. I'm whoever is, you know, coming with Jesus, but beyond the clouds, amen? And last verse I got for you, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Amen. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Amen. For we shall see Him as He is. Verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Amen. Brethren, you are pure right now. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. You're pure right now. You don't have to sin. You don't have to follow that old guy. You can follow that new guy. You can look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and just look toward that new name. Man, I don't know what that new name is, Lord, but if I have any say in it, I want it to be a good name. I'm going to follow after that good name. And if you do that, if you'll keep that in mind, even though you're pure, your soul is pure. It's spotless. It's sinless. You've been spiritually circumcised if you're saved. You will purify yourself. You'll purify this guy. And so if you'll do that, then you can finally get to whatever that next level is that you've been wrestling with God for so long. Year after year you come here. And maybe, maybe one year it's a different name you've got to give up to the Lord. Maybe this, this year it's fear. I just, Lord, I fear what that looks like for me to just break that alabaster box. I fear it. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's a lack of forgiveness. Maybe it's uh, you're, you're just grieving the Holy Spirit in your day-to-day -day walk. I don't know what that name is, but you know what it is. So if you can come to grips with it, say it to God, and then forsake it, get it behind you, forget about it, count it as dung, and press toward the high mark and calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Then you can finally get victory over that thing. Amen. And last thing I'll say, look in verse 30. You know, you know when you get the name? You know when you get that new name finally? I can't wait, man. I'm looking for that new name. Verse 30, And Jacob called the name of the place 
Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Brethren, that, that face to face meeting is coming any day now. And it's just, at, 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 a, at one, it's just going to be you and God. And He's going to give you that new name. And Lord, I, uh, Lord, I don't want to be ashamed. I'm, I've, I'm sick of having a name I'm ashamed of, Lord. I, I want to have a good name. And I do believe it'll be a good name, amen? amen. So if, if, you can, if you can just just get that finally this year, understand what it is, all the things, and be aware of that old guy, how he's going to work on you and he's going to try to fight against you so that you can avoid him, then finally, brethren, you can finally live victoriously uh, seeking after that new name. And that's all I got.